Uh, thanks, Brother John. Well, it's good to be back. I can tell you that. Terrific to be here. Been looking forward to this. Not so much looking forward to this, but uh, being in the meeting again. It's uh, already been a real blessing. Let's um, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs thirty-one. Proverbs 31, and we'll start in verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. So we see here, uh, there's, there's more to read, but we, what we've seen so far, the, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Okay, um, King Lemuel. Now, I don't see King Lemuel in any of the genealogies. Um, in fact, these, there's two references to Lemuel in this passage here, and that's all, all you hear of him in, in the Bible. Um, there's some speculation as to who this King Lemuel actually actually was. Um, some have, have uh, said that uh, possibly just Solomon himself uh, and Lemuel being maybe a pet name that his mother Bathsheba used to call him. The term Lemuel, the name Lemuel, means devoted to God. So whoever this King Lemuel was, um, I, I like to take a bit of a liberty with this and, and put it in terms that we would understand being part of the church. You know, we know that uh, we've become kings and priests to God. We're devoted to God and this prophecy is something that his mother taught him and and i know throughout the word of god we see a lot how the the mother is sort of related to to the church or the church to a mother so that for me gives this this passage a lot, a lot of a lot of depth and and it becomes relatable to me in my walk in the lord when you're considering that well Okay, if I take King Lemuel to myself, perhaps, you know, I, I like to think, and, and uh, by the grace of God, I, I believe that I am devoted to God. I'm filled with his Holy Spirit. Um, and and I'm, I love to listen to the things that my mother, the church, has taught me. We got down to, to verse 4. Not, not for kings to drink wine nor princes strong drink. And let, in verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So this prophecy, this, this passage that King Lemuel was taught by his mother, okay, abstain from, from immorality, abstain from from the, the dark things of the world and also from alcohol. But why, what, what was the, the, the key reason to uh, abstain from alcohol? Because it will make you do silly things. It will affect you, your personality. It will uh, cause you to wake up with a splitting headache and, and red eyes. No, it wasn't talking about the ill effects of alcohol on the person themselves, but what I really saw in this was, I'll read verse 5 again, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So what I see here and, and what we see throughout the word of God with regard to those who are devoted to God is the testimony. 
is, is not so much looking at ourselves and seeing how things are going to affect us, but we have a testimony before the afflicted. So this, the concern about remaining sober is because you have a testimony. If you're devoted to God, there are, there are the afflicted. You are surrounded by the afflicted and you need to be a testimony of a way, a way out for them. And the next verse, oh, sorry, we'll skip down to uh, verse 8. It says, open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. We are a people who, for whom the, uh, the judgments and statutes of the Lord are, are part of our lives. We understand them. We, we, they've been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord through the grace of God and, and the receiving of our salvation. We, we've been taken from that place of being afflicted to being blessed. Open thy mouth for the dumb, it says. Speak for those who can't, who can't speak for themselves. Plead the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Well, we all were. We were in that boat. We were appointed to destruction simply by being born into this world, being born in sin. We praise the Lord for his grace upon us that, uh, that we've received our salvation. We're now, we're now like this King Lemuel. We are devoted to God. And there are things that we need to be taught by, by the mother. And that's why we, uh, we need to be in our fellowships. We need to come together to hear the word spoken, to have the, the, the Bible open to us and, and scriptures expounded. And by the Holy Spirit be led into all truth. We're no longer dumb. We have something to say. But we are surrounded by the unsaved who, until the Lord intervenes in their life, they, their mouths are sealed. They, they can't speak. And so we need to, to go in to bat for them. So we need to, uh, to be a people who have a testimony of the, of the working of God in our lives. Not, not being like the drunkards staggering around through this world, you know, having, having no, uh, no testimony to display. It, it brought to mind, um, you know, if, if we're uh, the upholders of, of, of justice and truth, in the eyes of the Lord. You know, you think about this world and, and the amount of injustice that is, is going on, the amount of, uh, the amount of things that, that you hear of, of, of people that have suffered injustice and maybe the legal system has failed them or, or, or um, they've, they've just never found anyone who, who could stand up and speak for them. Of, um, been reading a little bit about a situation in the UK. I don't know if anyone else has, has heard about this, but there's um, a big issue in the, the postal service in the UK um, where all these uh, sub post office managers, I think there was 700 odd folk that were managing small post offices around, around the UK. Um, they were, they were being accused of, uh, of thieving money from the, the postal service. Um, interesting that, that so many of these people were being accused. You would have thought there was a bit of a bit of a light bulb, a bit of a, a red flag there to say, hang on, something's going on here. How, why is it that suddenly so many sub post office managers are dodgy? Sort of all like, most like there's this inherent corruption within the postal service. And so since about 1999, there's been all these sub post office branch managers that have been, they've lost their jobs or some have been sent to jail um, because they've been accused of embezzling funds because the, uh, the software that the postal service used was a, I think it was called Horizon 
um, accountancy software or something from, made by Fujitsu. Turns out that there was a glitch in this software and shortfalls in the, in the money were, were cropping up all over the place uh, without any explanation of where these funds had gone. And so all these, bank, uh, these post office managers were being accused of theft. And this had been going on for 20 odd years and there'd been no one uh, standing up for them, no one speaking for them. I think one even might have committed suicide. People's lives destroyed, livelihoods, lives destroyed, marriages falling apart because of the stress of, of this situation. And it wasn't until uh, a TV sort of, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a, doco, a documentary sort of uh, serial was made, a four-part uh, documentary show on, on this particular issue. It was called Mr Bates versus the Postal Service. I think it was a, a chap called Bates was one of these managers. And so this uh, TV miniseries was aired only just a couple of weeks ago, and it highlighted this this problem within the postal service, this, this story about all these people being uh, suffering injustice and being thrown into jail and what have you. And suddenly a million people signed a petition that, that all, these, all these convictions be quashed. There was this massive uproar. Suddenly it came to the light of the public and the public sort of as one went into bat for justice for these people. Of course, you had the legal service saying, oh, we can't do that. We, you know, we can't just sort of quash everyone's convictions. It's got to go through the legal system. We've got to have court cases. And you know, of course, they want their money, don't they, the lawyer, lawyers? You know? uh, in fact, there might have been a few people that had tried to take on through the courts to have their, their, their conditions, convictions overturned. And whatever compensation they might have received was all swallowed up in legal fees. So it didn't help them. But I think there has already, just within days of this TV show coming out, a law has been introduced for this specific issue that these people's convictions be, be quashed. But it took a TV series. Going through the normal channels wasn't working, hadn't worked for 20 years. And you, you feel for the people that had suffered this injustice all these years, how they must have felt dumb it's like their, their mouth were just, no one was listening, no one was hearing them. And that's just, just one example, it's a current example, but just highlights the, the amount of injustice that, that goes on in this world because people don't have the Lord. People are afflicted. Verse 8 again, I read, open thy mouth for the dumb. In the cause of all such as are appointed, to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. The poor and needy. The word speaks a lot about the poor and needy. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Actually, before, might pay to put your, the ribbon in your Bible or, or something and just, we might come back to, to uh, Proverbs 31. But we'll go to Matthew 5. This is what's known as the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Um, we see in verse, verse 2, it says, and he, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the first utterance in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, it's not saying the, the poor in the natural. He's not speaking about those who are destitute or, or those that just don't have any money. What it's saying is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean, the poor in spirit? Well, I, I had a look at, for example, I just looked up the Amplified version, and I liked what it said here, the way it explained it. It's, blessed are the poor in spirit. It says, those devoid of spiritual arrogance those who regard themselves as insignificant. So immediately, the first thing Christ refers to 
He goes on to say, blessed, you see, blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are they that are per persecuted for righteousness' sake, blessed are ye when all men shall revile you, persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. But the first thing he, he draws their attention to is the poor in spirit. And I like how it says here, those devoid of spiritual arrogance and those that, can, that don't consider themselves anything. They, they don't have tickets on themselves. So we're talking about it, people with, with humility. That's what the Lord can work with. And we all needed to come to that state of humility in order to be saved in the first place. So what the Lord's looking for is the, the, the poor, the poor and needy in spirit. Those, those with a heart who can humble themselves to the Lord, those who the Lord can touch, can work with, those that can become devoted to God, like King Lemuel, like the name suggests. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's go to John 3. This is uh, John the Baptist here. John the Baptist talking to um, uh, people that came up asking him about, you know, Jesus is here now, what does that mean for you? And um, he said in verse 28, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I, that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So here immediately we, we see the, the humility of John the Baptist, knowing that his job was now fulfilled. He, he needs to diminish. He needs to be of less significance now that Jesus has, has come and taken over. I must decrease. He must increase. John was poor in spirit. He didn't have that spiritual arrogance. He knew his place. He knew the Lord had come. The one that he he'd, uh, he went to prepare the way before had come. The, the bridegroom was there now. In verse 30, 31, it says, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, referring to himself, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So John was saying here that I, I only know so much. I'm just, I'm of the earth, I'm earthly. But Christ is, is heavenly. He's the one that knows all things. My understanding, my experience is limited by this natural life that I've been born into. But I'm handing over now to someone who is heavenly. There's no limitations on Christ and what he can do, how he can bless how he can uh, look after us, how he can judge righteous judgment, how he can impart unto us that ability to judge righteously. I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the postal issue. There was, a, there was a problem with the software. Now, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of detail that I haven't seen yet, but, uh, but about when... Uh, when it started to come to light about the issues with the software, how many people would have been ducking for cover? How many people would have been wanting that truth of the issue of the uh, problematic software, how they would have loved for that not to come to light? So there would have been moves afoot to keep, keep the, uh, the guilt on these, on these poor people because, you know, if it came out that this software was dodgy, What's that going to mean? So there's, there's truth that then needs to be hidden. There's all sorts of machinations that happen behind the scenes to, to stop the truth from getting out. So there are times where in the, throughout this world where truth is deliberately manipulated or, or hidden, covered up. I thought of the word propaganda. So as I like to do, I looked it up, see what the, what the dictionary says about it. 
Propaganda, the speaking of ideas, information, oh, sorry, the spreading, the spreading of ideas, information, rumours, allegations or images to deliberately further one's cause or to deliberately damage an opposing cause. So throughout election campaigns, you know, there's propaganda put out to discredit the opposition or to, to push th themselves. And we see, you know, the world, there's very clever people in, in projecting images or proje projecting statement, statements of a certain fact to push an agenda, to, to make their cause seem the righteous one. Or there'll be those images to, you know, you might see a photo of a politician, they might catch him at a very awkward moment or her with a evil sort of look on their face. And it can happen. I mean, I've seen enough photos of myself. We're just taking an inopportune moment and boy, I look like someone you wouldn't want to cross in a dark alley. Probably look like that when I smile, I don't know. But, but you know what I mean? There's, there's images and, and they've been used in, I remember the guilty party. Remember the, the guilty party? It was a Victorian election campaign. It was brilliant. And all these members of the, the Labor Party and, and the photographs of their faces, or, or there was one guy and they had his eyes darting from right to left and he looked like he was the most dodgy guy on the planet. But it was effective, but it was propaganda. It was unfair, really, to do that to, a, to an image. Propaganda, originally used in a religious context from the Latin term, which I'll no doubt pr pronounce really badly, Congregatio di propaganda fide, which means congreg congregation for the propagating of the faith. What this was was a group of Catholic curia established in 1622 by Pope Gregory the 15th. Now, before you leave today, you're going to have to, uh, we're going to have a little exam on this. So, um, by Pope Gregory the 15th as a means of furthering Catholic missionary activity. So that's where propaganda came from originally. It wasn't until the beginning of the 1800s that it began to be used as a term denoting ideas or information of questionable accuracy as a means of adva advancing a cause. Interesting that propaganda can be traced back to the pushing of Catholicism, but that's where it came from. So propaganda it's it's the pushing of a bit of truth the use of a bit of truth to push a cause is it the full truth hmm well propaganda the very word sort of uh, infers implies questionable but that's the sort of stuff that's out there we see it in everyday life we are in a, in a society, in a world these days, the flood of information, the likes of which we, we'd never seen before, generations previous had never had the kind of access to the information that we have now, through the internet, through social media, it's just everywhere. And there's a lot of, a lot of the information is simply not true. There are people that have agendas that they want to push. And I thought of an example of a very, a person who was uh, an absolute liar in, in the Old Testament. I thought of uh, the story of, of Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house. Now, for the sake of time, I won't, I won't read the story. It's in Genesis 39. But Joseph was a slave in Egypt and he was given a role in, in the house of Potiphar. Now, the, you could sort of glean from the verses that, that Potiphar might not have been, he was obviously a wealthy man, but his greatest concern in his life was food. Sounds like he, he was most concerned about what he ate. And his wife, uh, I don't think she rated all that highly in his priorities, but, but she took a shine to Joseph and uh, wanted him to behave himself inappropriately with her and he refused uh, and it came to a point where one day they were alone in the house and she tried to uh, 
proposition him again. He refused again, but this time she grabbed his cloak and he, he fled, leaving his cloak in her hand. And so feeling humiliated, this, this woman then cried out as if he, uh, Joseph had tried to force himself upon her. And, and the upshot of it was um, the accusation was made against Joseph. His garment was shown to Potiphar. He ended up being cast into prison. Now, this woman, she, she lied. She was humiliated. She had an axe to grind. And she was happy to see uh, Joseph then cast into prison rather than tell the truth. Now, the Lord blessed Joseph while he was in prison. Uh, and interestingly enough, there was never any resolution to that. Joseph, from what I see in the scriptures, was never sort of exonerated from that, but it didn't matter because the Lord so blessed him anyway. But he was an example of someone who could not give two hoots about the truth. She had an issue. She was humiliated uh, once <laughs> that saying is no hell hath no fury like a woman scorned uh, and she was happy for joseph to languish in jail for over two years i'm not exa exactly sure how long but at least two years so that sort of stuff happens there are people out there that the word is full of uh scriptures i can just uh Exodus 20, we've got the, uh, the Ten Commandments. The Ninth Commandment says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Uh, Psalm 35, verse 11, False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. So he was, David accused of things he'd, he'd never, never heard of it before. Yet there were people out there rising up and laying to his charge things that he knew not. Uh, Proverbs 19, verse 5, we read, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. So the Lord takes this very seriously. Proverbs uh, 6, verse uh, 16, uh, it speaks of six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And he lists through them, and the sixth one is um, a false witness that, that speaketh lies an abomination to the Lord. So as, as, a, as a church, as a people with the testimony of the Lord, we, we don't have a problem with, with speaking the truth. We don't have a problem with lies. I don't believe we have a problem with lies. Praise the Lord. Because we understand what the Lord thinks of liars and lies. We are a people that our, our whole um, motivation in life is to speak the truth of the word of god because those afflicted that i mentioned earlier we're surrounded by them they are dumb they don't have a voice they don't have an advocate we can bring them to the lord and the lord can then take away all the affliction out of their life even in the new testament we see in, in mark um, where Jesus was, uh, was being accused, it says, for many bear false witness against him. Many. But their witness agreed not together. And we see with the stoning of Stephen, uh, they, people were actually uh, bribed to tell lies about Stephen. People were happy to accept money to tell a lie about this guy. And he ended up being stoned to death. So that's the sort of heart that's in that can be in people without the Lord. That stuff goes on. There are also things like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example here. Sometimes you might hear something, perhaps about someone else, and you can be very quick to jump to a conclusion about them. Maybe you can be very quick to accept the opinion of the person that's told you something about this other person. Maybe you don't particularly like the person they're talking about, so you're happy to accept information that sort of consolidates or confirms your opinion of that person. I'll give you an example. There's a musician I particularly dislike, and he's just released an album which is absolutely abominably terrible. And I love that because I don't like him and I love to see people 
getting stuck into this terrible album and saying how bad it is. But occasionally, like I'm reading through different forums or whatever, and, and you might get someone that likes it. And so I immediately dismiss that person as a, some kind of idiot. I mean, how could you possibly like that album? So, so I, I will immediately dismiss that point of view because I don't agree with it. It doesn't, it doesn't push my agenda towards this musician that I don't like. So sometimes we can be influenced by our own thoughts. And that's, we've got to be really careful about that because like I say, you, you might hear something about someone and, and be happy to jump to a conclusion that they are that bad or they've done this thing that they're accused of doing without actually knowing the detail. If we go to, um, let's go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, and in verse 13, I better turn there myself. Now, I'm, I'm not reading these verses out or giving this talk because I think there's anything like that happening here. I'm, I'm simply bringing it out because it's something that came to my mind and it is something that, that even in, in our natural day-to-day -day lives, we need, to, we need to be aware of and be careful of, even outside of the assembly, because these things can influence us. And if we see, read in uh, Proverbs 18, verse 13, it says, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. Sometimes you can jump to a conclusion because it's, it's a conclusion that, that you want to be the conclusion. You have a, a particular opinion on someone or something and you hear something that, uh, that confirms that. Yes, you want to jump to it. But without giving, without giving the other person an opportunity to speak or to give their side of the story, it's a folly and shame unto him, the word says here. And if we go down to verse 17, it says, He that is first in his own cause seems just, but his neighbour comes and searches him. Well, what does that mean? Well, the way I see this is, is someone can come and, and, and tell you something and they seem like they're telling the absolute truth and everything's spot on. Maybe they're talking about their neighbour, but then you get to speak to the neighbour and you get their side of the story and you find, whoa, hang on. That's not how it was. So suddenly you've got this conflict of, well, who's telling the truth? But you could have happily just listened to the first one and gone away, not given the neighbour a chance to speak. This might seem like a silly uh, analogy here, but strangely enough, it's where this talk actually initiated. Last year we had the... Uh, the Cricket World Cup, the uh, One Day International Cricket World Cup. Now, uh, there was a particular game between Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And for some reason, I was interested in, in the result of this game. So on my phone, I can find this cricket app and it gives the, the scorecards and also some commentary on, on the match, ball by ball. And so I, I was interested to see how many runs my favourite Sri Lankan player, a guy by the name of Russell Arnold, no, hell, Angelo Matthews, Angelo Matthews. Real good Sri Lankan name there, Angelo Matthews. Yeah, he's Sri Lankan. He was my favourite player because he was the oldest, right? I've got a soft spot for the old. He's probably playing his last World Cup. And I looked at his, looked through the scorecard and I saw Angelo Matthews, naught, off naught balls, timed out. I'd never seen that before. Timed out. When a, when a batsman goes out, the next batsman in the World Cup, he had to be in position facing up the next ball in two minutes. Angelo Matthews hadn't made it out in two minutes. So, so he got, well, the opposition captain must have said, look, no, two minutes is up. He's not ready. He's out. So the umpire gave him out. So I, I scrolled across to the commentary. I thought, oh, gee, this, this is interesting. Sounds like, like reading from the commentary, he got out to the middle. Oh, I've got the wrong helmet. Oh, ump, can I go back and get me other helmet? 
no, that's not on, you're out. And I'm thinking, well, what an idiot my good friend Angelo Matthews turned out to be. You know, this experienced batsman made such a, you know, a silly mistake. You know, wanders out in the middle, oh, hang on, I've got the wrong helmet. So I formed an opinion of what had happened and what I thought of this guy based on this little bit of information. But what I found out sometime, oh, well, a short time later, because there's quite a, a furor erupted around this dismissal. Turns out that he'd got out into position, ready to face the next ball. He still had five or 10 seconds to spare, plenty, plenty of time. But the strap on his helmet broke. Suddenly his helmet was unfit to wear. Now that only just happened when he got there. Sort of changed everything suddenly. Um, my opinion of him just being stupid, suddenly, oh, well, there's a legitimate reason. So he approached the umpire, look, my, my helmet's just broken. Um, it's not fit to wear, I, I need another helmet. Then the, then the opposing captain registers his disapproval, appeals to the umpire and they say, well, I suppose we've got to give you out. So things were dramatically different from what I initially thought based on this little bit of information from a commentator who's sitting up in the commentary box. So what I'm getting at is, if you're, if you're not there, if you weren't there, if you weren't privy to exactly what happened, we've got to be careful not to jump to conclusions, to judge people. We don't know all the detail sometimes, most times. We are a people that love justice. We are the King Lemuels of this world, those devoted to God who are there to speak righteously, to lead people, to, to show a, a testimony, to abstain from the ways of the world, to, to give people an avenue to the one who can release them from the oppressor. In fact, I'll just quote a couple of scriptures here that I just loved when I read them. In um, Proverbs 29, verse 14, the king that faithfully judges the poor, his throne shall be established forever. His throne shall be established forever because he faithfully judges the poor. Psalm 72, verse 4, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Isaiah 11, verse 4, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, the poor in spirit, those without spiritual arrogance. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. There's so much in the word for us to take hold of, of, of the righteousness and the justice of the Lord. In a world where there's truth is so clouded, truth is so difficult to actually get to, you might have something, an incident just take place in front of you and five witnesses see it and they, they can go away and you might have five different versions of what happened. Like John the Baptist said, I'm, I'm earthly. You know, I, I can, my experience, you know, is limited by my natural thoughts and, and my eyes and, you know, whereas Christ is, is, is of the heavenly. So let's, let's ensure that we're a people that don't ju jump to conclusions and judge people. It's not our place. We want to judge righteously. We want the Lord's judgment, the, the spirit of God to be what, what uh, highlights what the truth is. So much in life doesn't matter what you think. I mean, my... My uh, opinion of that musician doesn't matter. Who cares what I think, whether I like his music or not? But when it comes to the serious things of life, people look at us. There are people out there that are oppressed and afflicted. They don't have a voice. They don't have a mouth to speak. They're the dumb that we see. King Lemuel was told to, to you're the one to speak for them.
we are needed. We need to have our testimony unsullied. We need to be a people that the unsaved can look to and, and know that there's something about them. I, I trust them. I believe what they say. I've run out of time. I don't want the trap door opening up. So I'll hand back now to, to Brother John Smith. Thanks, John.